Hey, what's up, guys? This is Kyle. This is the You Know I Got So In Stereo podcast. We got one person here who doesn't eat beef. We got another guy here who only listens to Keith. And we got Mr. Barry B. I am the HOST. And Tom, we also have a special guest in the house. Uh, tell us who the special guest is. And I want to introduce our special guest. Uh, we're big supporters of this guy. He's been big support, a big supporter of You Know I Got So. We love what he's doing since the first project. And he's continued to make great R&B music with each project. So... Big welcome to Noel Gordine. What's happening? What's happening? I appreciate you for having me. Good to have you. And uh, before we get into the discussion, you want to just talk a little bit about what you've got uh, coming up and working on right now? Okay. Well, I'm uh, right now. I'm, I'm, you know, just still grinding on the road, staying on the road, and, and promoting my latest album, City Heart, Southern Soul. Um, but I'm working on my new project, and uh, I'm really excited about it because. You know, really, I'm I'm trying to dig in and, and rub elbows and work with some people that I've really admired, um, you know, in the, in the soul and B genre and in, in the soul and R and B and uh, the artists that are making music. I think that are, that probably, arguably, the best in the industry actually has substance and um, you know, taking time to really put you know that 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 real R and B and soul and uh, like I said, substance and um, you know, just making music the way it, it, it should be made, you know, with care and, 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 and just that, that true heart and soul. Um, so, you know, I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about telling people uh, about who I'm, you know, telling who I'm trying to work with on this on this project. But, <clears throat> you know, I, I really don't want to jinx anything. Um, you know, a lot of people have, have agreed. So until I get them in the booth and we, we uh, really start to put the vocals down on the records, uh, but, you know, I really don't want to uh, talk about who's going to be on it. But, uh, it, you know, this album is going to be something um, where I have some duets and, and doing records featuring people that I've wanted to do for a while. So uh, it's going to be really good. I'm working on my, my radio show that I've had for going on a couple of years now. Uh, it's called The Soul and Be Revival, which is, you know, trying to, um, preserve and conserve that, that that true artistry of the soul and B genre, and uh, you know artists that are underappreciated, uh, just like what you do, uh, Tom. So you know I'm just trying to do that with my radio show and, and try to spotlight some artists that are uh, like unknown. I try to do things for unsigned artists as well. So you know just trying to, to trying to bring back um, you know that that true soul and B music and, and people that truly love doing what they're doing and uh you know just trying to put it back on top where it should be that's dope man speaking on that city heart southern soul project ed you wrote a review for you know i got soul you love the album speak about it yeah it was one of my um of my favorites from last year i think it came out really early last year and it made my list of um one of my favorites for the year and i love that you said you wanted to go back to the the duets, and I think if I remember right, you had one of a- with Avery Sunshine on that album, and it was one of my favorites. Can you talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to my heart? It's like we've lost the art of duets in R and B these days, and like, what what happened? What where'd it go? And why can't we get it back? Is it that artists don't want to link up and connect anymore? What's is something missing from that? And I wish we could get it back. You know what I think it is a lot of I mean and it's sad but <clears throat> you know you go to reach out to work with somebody and it's like a whole lot of stuff in between you know it it's a lot of egos going around that makes it really really tough so when you really try to you know work with somebody and you know how budgets are nowadays they're almost not existing of course. Of course. but uh when you're working with somebody and you know there's going to be something there where it's going to it's going to be a fee if you're trying to work with somebody that's uh you know that's pretty established in the industry but you know i think that's what it's come down to it's come down to whether they're asking for a fee that's too, you know too extensive or it's just too many people in between you can't really link with an artist nowadays one on one and when you're able to it's it's pretty rare so um you know and i i think it comes down to to that to really being able to you know, speak with somebody and try to give them your vision and what you're what you're trying to do. Um, you know, because a lot of the times it's really about the budgets nowadays and and what people you know what people want to be able to work with them. Um, as far as when you're able to to do it 
with somebody, you know, to get down on the track with somebody and you actually got them there and that you guys are in the studio and ready to, um, you know, to, to let the, let the juices flow. You know, I, I don't think that it seems like it's just two great singers on a track instead of them, you know, melding together and really having something, you know, because what I use is really as a template is, I mean, what would you think of Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell? Something, right. something where it sounds like they're really together and they're singing together about something. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I mean, when you that's think what of I tried to do with, with Avery history, Sunshine. You know, that's what I right. on my on my other album. I tried to do that with my second album, Fresh the Definition. I tried to do that with with uh, you know Miss Courtney Harrell. Um, mm-hmm. To tr- really try to have something where it sounds like you're singing together and you you really mean it. You know, so th- that's the thing. You know, on one side of the spectrum, it's really trying to get to uh, get with each other to try to um, talk out the the vision and where you see a record going with a, a particular artist. Uh, but then on the other side, you know, when you when you're able to get to them, you're really ready to do a record to really make something that that's worthwhile and something that really can um, you know strike people to to pull you know to grab somebody's attention. Or, or to pull at some heartstrings the way they used to. So, you know, I'm always trying to use the old, you know, the retro, go back in the day to, to use that as a template uh, and what I want to do. So, um, you know, if I if I get the chance, like I said, on this next project coming up, I, I really got some r- really powerful stuff coming. So, um, but I think that's what it is, you know. Yeah, I mean, well, you talked about a template. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Ride with it. Ain't lying. <laughs> Uh, keeping on the uh, the topic of duets, um, Noel, you spoke a little bit about that passion and that chemistry, you know, in the booth. Let's um let's take a trip down memory lane, uh, you know, two thousand two thousand and one, where you know duets were almost you know running the airwaves. You know, every other song was pretty much a duet, male female. Uh, you had Avon, you had Kiki. Um, what was some of y'all's favorite duets, you know, that may have came out in the last maybe 10, 15 years that, you know, really strike a, a bone and, and it really takes you back to a nostalgic point in your life? Um, let me see. Like you spoke about the the Kiki and, and Avant joint. That was, that was like crazy. Um, recently, I tell you what, I like that record with, uh, with, um, Jay Holiday, Jennifer, Holl- um, Jennifer Hudson, in R. Kelly, I like that joint. Like that has a that has a retro feel to it, uh, and like a you know I like to call it retro relevant. Whereas that throwback, but it's still relevant enough to to you know really grab some folks in, in today's time, the younger folks, and still have that you know that retro feel, that throwback feel. Um, you got Babyface, and you could pretty much name whoever he's sang with, pretty right. much. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he always has that that feel. Um, I mean, of course, it's a, that baby face signature feel, but um, right. you know, it's it's got that feel. That Tony Braxton, that that what he worked with her on, it, it really has that. It has a wonderful feel to it. Um, you know, I, w- I would say it's a, it's along that line. Um, but the, I always like to have it a little. I love that retro relevant feel. I mean, the, that's that's what I call it. Um, it, it really has a, it. You got to have that that chemistry, man. If you don't have the chemistry, people are going to be able to tell. Um, I always say that you know, if it doesn't have that that particular feel to it, where people can't lose themselves in the track, where it just sounds like you know, because a lot of it seems like a lot of artists today they'll sing because they can do it. They're not, you know, right. particularly they're not really throwing themselves into it. And that's what I want. Talking about duets, that's what I really want to do. I really want to. Um, have people think that we're actually in a relationship. If you could do that, right, right. you know, then you're, you're, you're doing something. You're working with fire. So that's always my intention whenever I'm stepping in, uh, you know, into the booth with a, with a female to do a, a duet. I mean, just know that that's my, that's my mission. If I could do that, uh, like I feel I did with Avery and, and Courtney Harrell, and uh, I just did a record with a, a artist, a wonderful artist, Latrice Bush, uh, called Because mm. of You. So, you know, if I can really lean into it and make people really feel that we're we're connecting on the track and and you know making it putting that putting that sweat on it you know what i'm saying that's that's right. what i uh, always look to do man and speaking of sweat um <laughs> and you see my boys are laughing noel they 
they know where I'm going. If you know me, I am the biggest Keith Sweat stand you will ever find. And you're talking about duets. <laughs> Yeah. That man has a list. I mean, he's got make it last forever. He's got mm-hmm. nobody. He's got all the joints with cut clothes. And right. every cut time, yeah. oh, man, y'all slept on cut clothes. But the thing yeah, is that did, man, that was the same too, right? Oh, they were fire. And yeah. like you said, the key was going all the way back to the Tam and Terrell, David Ruff in old school. Like you mm-hmm. felt like they were in a relationship. Okay, right. um, JoJo and Mary J, like that type mm-hmm. of thing is what – really kind of made it stand out as opposed to kind of songs we hear today that I I may like right. when it pops to mind. No no hate, no shade, because I know how y'all right. do. Um, like the Brandy and Chris Brown song. I love that uh, song. Right. Yeah. But it just doesn't have that kind of connection that those earlier songs had. And I think, like you said, Noel, it's just missing that, that passion that feels like it's between two lovers. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's crazy that the you know you you named David Ruffin and Tammy Terrell they were actually in a relationship and then <laughs> then KC and uh, uh Mary J were in a relationship too. Yep, so, yep. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, you I mean, you can feel it. Yeah, really, you can, you can, and and that's digging in, man. That's that's you know that's um, making that music with integrity. It doesn't really matter what they're saying; it's how they say it and how they intertwine, uh, and how they you know it really comes down to how their voices. Um, you know, how they mend together as well. You know, uh, it, that's huge. If voices go together, um, you know, then, then it's it's going to be, it's going to be magic, man. So, right. you know, that's, that's really what the, I mean, like you said, I think it's coming back around with the duets. It was back around, what, a couple of years ago, it was back. And a lot of right. people were doing a lot of duets, um, you know. Uh, so I think, I don't know, man, I think it's coming right back around. I think people are really getting into it. I don't know if it's the change in the weather. Or you know right. what it is, but uh, you know, they I think got y'all feeling away. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I think it's coming back around. Now, part of the uh, the chemistry also is the production. So, like, what do y'all? How do y'all think we're, you know, with with technology advancing like it is? You know, you practically can do anything on the computer. Mm-hmm. What do you guys feel like we're going back towards, you know, with the Tyrese album and, uh, you know, a lot of the, you know, the Jill Scott album that we had this year, we had a lot of um, live production that was, was brought back. Do y'all mm-hmm. think that's something that we're also getting back towards in R&B? You know, the live production where the producer is, is, is creating it while the artist is there. And, you know, then you have that, that chemistry also with the artist. Well, I mean, you know, there, there's a couple of ways to, to look at that because, you know, the, whether it's getting popular again, because there's been a lot of artists that, is, that have been doing that the whole time. You know what I mean? There's a lot right. of artists that's been doing that live, that organic feel uh, for years and years. But whether it's coming back around and it's getting popular again, then that's another thing. Um, you know, because I always try to, to, to try to put as much live instrumentation on without losing a certain feel. You know, uh, like I always love to have heavy drums and all that kind of stuff. If we can get them mic'd up right as far as a drummer being in the studio, then that's what I like to go with. If I, I like that, I love the live feel, uh, but I, I don't want to sacrifice any kind of, you know, sound quality um, if a certain studio doesn't have the, you know, capabilities to do it in the right way. I do think that the live feel, you know, is coming back. Um, I should it had left? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it ever should have went out because, I right. mean, a lot of the times that's what that, that true essence of that soul and B music, that's where it came from. You know, the Funk Brothers getting down in Motown and, you know, all the live, um, you know, studio bands that they have for Stax and, and all of that. So, and, and, you know, Chess and all of that kind of stuff. They had those that live feel, man. And that's right. that authentic music in which, you know, I, I, I don't know about y'all, but when I was five to seven years old, when I really started getting into music, when my pops was playing that soul music, I know when it came on, it made me smile, and it still does yeah. that to this very day. You know, the live strings, the swirling strings and the horns, and, you know, that, that live guitar and the bass. Right. And to me, that's what soul music is. It's the bass. That bass is driving it. it. You can drop the drums out, and the bass can still tell the story. You know, so right. if you listen to how that bass used to walk all up and down the the rhythm. So, you know, I, I think I don't think it ever should have left that live feel. Um, and if it did, and if it's coming back to to that popularity uh, of the live field, then then I love it. You know, um, so th- 
you know that that Tyrese album is you know is bringing people back to to really recognizing the kind of feel that th- that music has. You know right. what I'm saying? So um, if it's coming back in and it's getting popular again, then that's fantastic. But you know, there's a lot of artists that have been doing that for years and years. You know, um, to try to keep it as as live as 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 much as they can. You know, the Eric right. Robersons and um, you know, and folks like that. So I love I love the live feel, and as much as I can get it into every single track that I do, that's what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. When you talk about that live feel and you know childhood, I mean, some of my best memories are, or actually my earliest musical memories are listening to like my parents. Christmas soul Christmas tapes oh, and stuff, man. and like those songs, like the, that stuff, like the emotions and and that yeah. Jackson Five, that stuff like hits you and it resonates and it has such a warm feeling of oh, nostalgia man. that just when you hear that in current production, you know it right. really hits you. And Dude, the life, the I mean, that, when you go out to a show, what do you want to hear? You want to hear a live band or you want to hear track? Or exactly, you understand what I'm saying? Exactly, it's, that's it's what I'm talking about. Way. It's that feel. It's that feel, yeah. And the thing is, I think when it comes to po- popular music, well, I guess I'll, I'll define it as this. I remember when Amy Winehouse, and one thing that really hurt me when we lost her, it seemed like she was going to bring that sound to popular music. Like, she was going to take that to Top 40 radio. So I was very excited. And, you know, when she passed, that was one thing I really think we missed out on. So while it hasn't broken out, and I don't think we're going to hear it any time on mainstream radio, unfortunately, for what many reasons that I'll rant about later, I, I am glad <laughs> to hear it become much more prominent with yeah. the no with the Tyrese's and with the Jill Scott's who are going to bring this back to R&B fans. So while pop fans are going to have to wait a minute, at least we're going to have it straight up. Yeah. Well, right. I, I can dig that. But, you know, they, they choose who they want to cross over into top 40 and, and all of that kind of stuff, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever mm-hmm. it may be. Uh, they choose who they want it to, to carry over and, and uh, to cross over and all of that kind of stuff because that music is still around, you know. She brought no, it's it not and uh, she did it in a way where people – started to pay attention, you know, uh, whether it's by antics or, or who she was or just how carefree she was or, you know, whether it was by her, her character. But that music, she made it stand out and people took notice to it. But, you know, people have been making that music for, for a long, long time before and after her. So, you know, they choose who, and, and who they want to cross over, like I said. But, you know, they, she is missed, man. You know, it's music like that that – that really does bring it to to, to the light, and and you know can give some other artists some some uh, you know a, a soapbox to to stand on and, and display their talents. You know. Now speaking on production, I want to just go in a little bit of a different direction. We, you know, we we do this producer top ten list, naming the top ten songs we feel like a producer put out, and one of the ones we've got coming out is for KG, who I know Noel you worked with early on in your career had a big impact on your career, um, you know, did The River, which is one of your biggest singles. Right. Before we talk more about um, KG and the list and his impact with Divine Mill, uh, let us know what type of impact he's had on your career. I mean, KG was the one that he, he really gave me a chance, uh, you know, in this industry when before anybody even knew me. You know, so I was working with my man T.O., who had worked with KG in the past, you know, and Next and, and Jaheim and, um, you know, Coffee Brown and everybody that was over at Divine Mill and went through Divine Mill, um, you know, and my manager at the time. And we were just making music, and we decided to scrounge up whatever we could. We hustled up whatever money we could get and rented a car and headed out to New York and New Jersey. And, you know, I'll never forget those times because, you know, those those were the rough times. We were sleeping in the cars and, you know, like I said, we were hustling up whatever money we could get to buy some some footlongs so we could eat throughout the day and all of that kind of stuff. But, you know, those are the times that I treasure and never forget because those were times where you really remember people that looked out for you and really believed in what you were doing, you know. And it was those points like KG, um, you know, when the movie The Cookout came out. I wasn't even – I was mm. nowhere near signed. I wasn't really on no radars. We were making music and putting together a catalog, and he was like, you know, I, I want you to be on a part of this because he was doing the music. He was, you know, in charge of, of, of the music um, with, with Queen Latifah on that project. And, 
you know, it was that I just happened to get the intro, you know, to start out the music, um, the movie with uh, Family Reunion. So, you know, it was still, it, it's, it's things like that that you never forget and people that really believe in you. Um, and, you know, that was a validating moment for me. You know, it, it really let me know that I was doing uh, what I was supposed to be doing with my life and, and to have somebody like KG you know, who is a, a pillar in the hip-hop community and just music, you know, in the music industry as a whole to really look out and, and believe in me like that. So that meant a lot. And, uh, you know, he, he changed my life, man. And, and, and that was before, like I said, I was even on the radar in the industry. And uh, it, it meant a lot. And, you know, I, I speak to KG every now and then and, and just see how he's doing because, you know, it's kind of crazy, too, with both Virgos. His birthday is the day before mine on the, September 15th. Mine's the 16th, and, you know, oh, wow. we always reach out and, and, and hit up each other during the football season and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, big shout-out to KG. and he, He's done a lot. He's done a lot for me. Well, I think it's so dope about KG. He goes so unheralded. He's such a low-key guy. Yeah. You know, doesn't want the attention. But people don't even realize what he did with Divine Mill. You know, right. he had John A. He had Next. He had Jaheim. Like, these massive singles, Coffee Brown, you know. Yes, sir. So it's like so many, so many hits, and he goes unnoticed. But Ed, Ed Barry, you guys, do you have a favorite KG song or something that you stand out to you? Um, I don't know, like off the top, my favorite KG song, but my favorite album that he had a hand in is probably Jaheim's Ghetto Classics album. That album was so underrated, and I know he had a big hand in the production there. I think it's by far Jaheim's best work. And it really was top to bottom. It was only like ten or eleven tracks. So you know, if you read my reviews, I love those tight, those tight knit albums because it really flows well and doesn't wear out as welcome. And I think from top to bottom, that was peak Jaheim, even though it didn't have the big singles on it. And I know he really had a big hand in the production there. So when I think of him, I always think of that album. Uh, to me, you know, I was uh, when I when this a lot of this music came out, man. I was middle school high school so like it was more of the the anything record that's really really stuck with me you know with him and uh, Jaheim and, and and next and um to me that really showed a different side of R&B because we hadn't seen a group and a solo artist kind of come together on a record you know we we saw a lot of solo artists come together but the way that the group was used for R&B, you know, not being on a hip-hop record, but actually being on an R&B song, and it being so smooth and it still being played, you know, at, at weddings and, and just, you know, uh, sentimental moments in people's lives. I mean, that's just that's just timeless. So it's probably uh, one of my favorites. And it was cool how KG was using RL from Next to write for each of his um, right. artists on Divine Mill. And, that, you know, that was really cool when it helped RL get, you know, some stardom and build his pen on his own outside of what he did with Next. Yeah. Um, another thing I really want to touch on with you, Noel, and, and, and bring up with you guys is independent artists. You know, it's like the, the term to me, when I hear it, it's almost become like an oxymoron these days. I feel like music fans, they they put a stigma on independent artists. I feel like if you're not a major label artist, you're not doing it big. And I, I hate that. It really bothers right. me. You know, independent artists to me are, are making the best music right now. So, for you guys, do you feel like that stigma exists? Do you feel like there's a misconception around independent artists that needs to be broken down? Absolutely, I definitely feel that there's you know there's that stigma to it, and um, it's kind of you know when they when you say indie artists or independent artists, it's almost like a lesser artist, you know, but. I believe, you know, I believe we are making the best music in the industry, putting in the most integrity and really taking time with the with the projects and still actually making albums, you know, because it, it seems right. like the concept of the album has left the industry. It's kind of crazy. Mm. Um, and when you do try to make a cohesive album, you know, a collection of records that really tell a story, a, a cohesive story uh, that can go together, it's like people shun it. It's like, you know. Oh, you're not just trying to sell a, a single, huh? But like, like I don't understand that. And that, you know, it used to be people made albums. <laughs> I still call them albums. A lot of people call them CDs. I can't, I can't stand what they call them CDs. To me, it's an album. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're, right. you're really looking to make a collection, uh, you know, a cohesive project. Um, that, you know, a group of records that can tell a story and, and like a play in a sense. You know, so I mean. I don't know, man. It's it's it is a stigmatism, and it, you know it, it, it's terrible. 
it's terrible because I think, like you said, Tom, like I that really feel that we're making the best music in the industry. We're putting in the most care. Uh, a lot of these albums that come out, you really think about it and you listen, listen to it, and you're skipping all over the place. I'm, I'm like, who sat down at the round table to to okay these records? You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Where's the quality control at? Um, but you know what? <laughs> who am I to say anything if they're selling the way they're selling? And uh, I don't know. It's just you know, I, 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 I me. For me, I I, uh, I like to put in a, a lot of care, um, record by record, and you know I t- I put in I put in so much time just th- at the end of a record to hear the fade out be right. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like there's there's so much stuff that I like to do, um, and and put in th- just as a process of making a, a project on an album, um, and th- I don't know, man. It, it seems like th- there is like they look at us like we're th- condescendingly and looking down on, on independent artists, but. You know they can continue to do that because we'll just continue to make the music for the people that want to listen, and uh, you know just just keep giving them what they want, which is the quality music. You know. The funny thing wanna, is though, um, oh, you, go ahead, Bear. No, nah, I, I just wanted to, to bookmark something, and then I'm gonna let you go ahead and on at. Um, he's, you know, Noel really hit a point when he said, you know, where are the, you know, where are the albums. You know, so, you know, when we finish this up, I, I just kind of want to touch back on that because I was talking to myself a little bit earlier, just listening into a lot of the, the quote, you know, released music that's been put out. And you're not seeing albums, you're seeing more EPs and mixtapes being sold as albums. So I do want to, you know, back, uh, maybe put that in the back pocket and, and talk about that a little bit later on. But go ahead and post it yet. Well, it's funny to me on that, a little bit on that topic. <laughs> That um, we are in this industry that is so single driven that mm. it's almost like we're convincing the we're training the audience not even to buy albums because and I know um, Tom gonna have to hit the sensor button because he hate when I throw shade but I'm going <laughs> to do it because <laughs> everybody thought that your boy Fetty Wap he had hot single after a hot single after a hot single after a hot single and his album straight up brick. Because mm. nobody wanted a Fetty Wap album because I it's freaking Fetty Wap. Well, you get your hot single and then you're done with it. And that, there was so right. much surprise in the industry that his album didn't go triple platinum. I wasn't because are you really going to try to hear dude for 17 tracks? No, you want to hear him fake sing for three minutes and go to the next. And I think that's what we're training listeners to do. But let me get back on topic and not get kicked off the podcast. So what I wanted to say earlier is that I think that this mentality of kind of shunning independent artists, I think it even goes a little deep, and I don't want to get too deep in my AO.com columnist man routine, but I think we as a culture have just trained success to look a different way. And when we hear the word independent, it goes against what we're trained to hear success. And when we think of success, we think of big money, empire, foolish, throwing money everywhere, getting mm. fined and having a gazillion dollars and a gazillion dancers. And we hear independent and we think of something that's a lot tighter knit, a lot low key, not mainstream, and we don't see that as success. We see songs on the radio twenty four seven, Fatty Wap as success. Mm. And I think what we need to do as a culture is to better understand how we define success. And success isn't always just swimming in money like Scrooge McDuck. Um, I'm going. To, I'm going to point out a couple of things. I mean, I've always. Uh, lean towards the independent artists for a couple of things. They, No matter how you look at it, they set the trends. They always will, and that's never going to change. And what we're seeing right now is an industry that's kind of crippling due to um, new formats and new structures that's being put out, things like SoundCloud, um, things like Apple Music, um, and particularly Apple Radio, and I point that out because radio is coming back in a sense where it's maybe the only way you hear something first. And I think it's incredible that we're living in this time where we saw radio come in, we saw it kind of go away, and now we're seeing it come back because it's the only way you can hear um, some of the, 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 the voices that we, we don't know about, you know, Um you can go through sound SoundCloud is so big now, it's literally impossible to find 
certain artists or certain sounds or something that you're going for because it's just so it's so much out there. So you've almost jumped into this rabbit hole. But the radio, you know, this internet radio thing and like podcasts and things becoming more popular now are allowing independent artists to really take control of the will and um control what what's being heard and what the sound and the vibe is like. And it's, that's one of the biggest reasons I always uh, lean towards them. But the, more importantly is I love the creativity that would never die and the, the hunger and the fight. So, I mean, it's, it's funny that it's looked at as, you know, a negative or a condescending thing to, to, to quote unquote, be independent. But it, it should really be like the cool thing. You know, Raheem likes to say, like, and the, independent is the new, ma- the new major. And that's really how it's kind of like going is because it's, it's almost, it's cool. Like I, 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 I don't really listen. You go through a mile apart classic, you don't see too many, you know, majors. And it's just because I want to know what's next. Like I want to know what's new. I want to know what's different. And that's kind of like the cool thing to do now. And um, I'm always going to be appreciative and supportive of independent artists. I know, love that. It, like, that's dope what you just from said. Stretch. But it's you know that stretch. comes from record executives, not, they don't take chances anymore. It's all about the bottom line and the dollar, um, and, and and that's what it's about. There's no pioneers anymore, you know, to say, right. I like this artist, I like this feel, this music, this record is good. It's not a good record, it's a good record anymore. Remember, it used to be mm-hmm. a good record, it's a good record, it's a hit. Yeah. It's a hit. It's going to make moves. You know, it's going to make moves or it's going to make noise, and we're going to put this out here because we believe in this. It's not that anymore. They see what's working, and they try to just continue it, to the field, the, the the wheels fall off. You know, it's like a conveyor belt with artists. Because if you really take a look for a while, they was, they were starting to look the same, sound the same, mm. videos were looking the same. You know, like the the record sounded the same because it was all the same people, writers and producers doing every record. Because you know they they all just follow the same you know formula. If it's working, they're going to continue it because there's no pioneers. It's really they don't have that. Uh, creativity anymore the way they used to have them back in the day all the execs they would see something and say you know this person's a star or they can't they can't do that anymore um so that's the reason why you see the the declining of record labels and all of that kind of mm-hmm. stuff because they really don't know what they're doing anymore you know there were some mm-hmm. people that i was going around and taking meetings with years ago and they were like you know what i i really like your music i'm gonna take it home and let my 15 year old listen to it and see what they say like mm-hmm. i was like really like, why aren't they here sitting in this chair then? You know what I mean? So right. it, it came down to people, they really don't, it's like a conveyor belt type of thing. It's all about the bottom line. You know, they don't take no time. The, you know, the pioneers used to say, look, I'm going to work on this, and we're going to make this thing work. They don't do that anymore. So, you know, and that, that that's all in what you say. They, I believe the indie artists are start setting the trends, but, you know, that's quiet as kept. You won't really know that. <laughs> because they're not getting the light of day. So, you know, right. if you go over to this side, the indie side, you'll see, wow, that's been around for a while. But on the other side, you know, the popular side and the and the, the, the side where the, the radio, they're getting the radio play like off the blicks, you'll see is new over there. But it's been happening mm-hmm. on the indie side for a whole long time. But you won't know that, you know. Just to speak on the other side, this is something Ed made me think of, and I don't, I don't want to say anything bad about indie artists, but, you know, in this single-driven market we're in, I've been a little disappointed recently with some established R&B artists who are indie who kind of go all big for that single. You know, it does well at radio, but then the rest of the album just is, like, so-so, and it's kind of like they didn't really put their all into it, and it's just a little disappointing to hear that. Like, when I heard Noel's um, Fresh to Definition album, it's like an album you can play straight through. I can tell you put the care into it. But like when I I don't want to name any artists, but like I just see it happening more often. It's like they just want to put something out so they can tour, and they're not really putting the care into it, and that that you know really bothers me a little bit. You know, I don't. It's not all. I wouldn't say it's a majority. It's just some here and there that I I know can do better, and I would like to see the majority. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) I would say it. And you know what else? There's a lot of artists, like you said, you don't want to mention any names. There's a lot of artists that could be, um, you know, really taking a stance on real R&B and soul music, mm-hmm. but they don't. You right. know, they, they do something. They're at a point where they can really make a change and say, look, this is what it should be. You know what I'm saying? Um, like Tyrese did with the last album. Um, what he was doing before that one, I don't know. But he took a stand and said, look, this is this is where it should be. Let, let, let's focus on this. There's a lot of artists that could be doing that, but don't. 
You know, they don't take the stance on the real music uh, and what it could be. You know, they they stick, they stay over here. I mean, uh, I'm I'm gonna name one. <laughs> I have to. My man Jamie Fox. I love the. You know, he's dope. But you look at his show back in the day. Who was he singing? He would always sing Stevie Wonder. He would sing all the old greats, right? Mm. But then you hear his records, and it's all of this the other stuff. Like, I don't understand where that comes from. Where Where's the soul music at? He played Ray Charles, for goodness sake. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Where's that soul music at from, from Jamie? Like, I want to see artists like that and people of that magnitude take a stand and, mm. and say, you know, wh- where's this music at? Where Where is it at? So that's what I'm looking for, and that's what, I, you know, a lot of when we, when we indie artists get together and we're on the road and all of that kind of stuff, we, we kind of talk about that. But, you know, whether it's going to change or, or people, you know, going to follow suit and start making, getting back to that real music instead of just looking for a check, you know, we'll, we'll see what's up. We'll see what's up. But, you know, it, it, all we can do is remain optimistic for this. I mean, I love this genre. I think it's the best music on the planet. And uh, like I said, all we can do is continue to make the quality music for the people that want to hear it, you know. So so let's uh, remain optimistic. Well, Noel, you mentioned Jamie, and it reminds me of my wife. She interviewed Jamie. She's a former entertainment writer. She interviewed him around the um, – around kind of the peak of his career when he was doing blaming and stuff. And she straight up asked him that question, you know, why, what happened to the Jamie Foxx soul sound? And he, he was honest. He was like, I, if it were up to me, I would sit in front of this piano and play these songs all day, every day. And this would be my album, but that's not what the, the, the label is wants me to do. So I wonder a lot of times, as Tom was saying, when we have these artists who drop one hot single and the album is meh, how much is the artist and how much is really the label controlling that? Because a lot of times when I do my reviews, people are surprised because I will give a higher review to an album that doesn't have the quote-unquote hot single, but is consistent all the way through, as opposed to an album that's got one or two bangers that's on the radio and then just a whole bunch of meh. So sometimes I think there is a balance in that, and a lot of times the the and you may be able to speak to this the 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 label gets in the way, and it's that constant struggle to get out quality music and to bow to their demands. Right. Well, I would say you know I, I mean I almost made this this mistake uh, while I was signed to Sony when I got signed to Columbia and then uh, you know went over to Epic. Um, I had to you know pretty much I always say it's an arm wrestle. Um, but you know, I did. I had to. I had to wrestle to get what I wanted to represent me in the industry. I had to more than I I wanted to or thought I would have to because when I went in, I had a certain kind of music. You know, whether they wanted to change it or or not, I wanted to have this type of music represent me in the marketplace. You know, this was the this is the artist that Noel Gordon is. So after my time, you know, it it became what I wanted to represent me in the industry because at the beginning, you know, I was getting thrown records out. I was like, who are they meaning to send this to? I think they sent it to one person. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I, I really take a stand in it. And I, to me, I think that's a cop-out, the way he answered that. Um, I think he would have just, if he had just said I did it for the money, I'd have, I'd have respected that at least. You know what I'm saying? Um, no, I agree. He's Jamie Foxx. <laughs> so he can stand up for what the, the type of music that he wants to do. You know, don't don't let. It, I mean, I almost made that mistake. Like I said, you have more power because they signed you because of what you brought to them. You know what I'm saying? They liked right. what you had. They loved. They loved what you presented. They're not going to throw all of this money into somebody that you know came in with, with trash. You know what I'm saying? So they they want to represent you to put you out there. So. I don't know. You know, it, it is it is what it is. You know, it, he he might be being honest with that, but whether you you put out there what you want to represent you, you know, so it's not like he couldn't have gotten a, got a, a deal anywhere else. You know what I mean? So no I think it, 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 see, and that's the that's the integrity that I'm talking about. You know that just like <laughs> just like you know your lady posed him with that question. It had to come from somewhere. She's thinking about it. A lot of people are thinking about things like that. You know what I'm right. saying? Blaming on the alcohol from, you know, Ray Charles and, and, and singing Stevie Wonder all his life. So it, it's just, it's, 
I don't know, man. It's kind of crazy to me, you know. It, and uh, I think it's gonna it's gonna need people to really take a stand. Like I said, a lot of these artists should be taking stands for the for the right thing for this type of music in which they grew up on. You put them in an interview, who they're gonna say that they were inspired by? But yet they're making this kind of music that that it's like you don't even want your 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 little uh, you know anybody ten and under listening to it. So. This is crazy, man. You know, when they get that level of integrity and, and respect back, I think I don't think it'll it'll change. You know, um, picking you know taking it out of my back pocket now the the EP mixtape you know album thing. I think that with albums uh, kind of going, you know, not necessarily being the front runner anymore, and EPs kind of taking uh, the, the spotlight, singles will start, uh, i say three to five years. I, I don't see singles being what they used to be anymore. You know, um, with these streaming sites, with so much, your single isn't necessarily the only thing available to people, if that makes sense. You know, I can go on Spotify, I can go on Apple Music right now, and I can listen to any song on your album. Mm -hmm. And I think what that would take away is, you know, while people are listening to radio less, I, I really think that single-driven uh, mode that we're in now is, start, is going to start going away and people will be forced. You won't have a choice anymore but to make albums that I can press anything on your album and it's going to be something that I want to buy everything. I want to listen to it. I want to be consumed and, you know, submerged in that particular album. I just don't think people are going to be able to sit around too much longer and just kind of tore off of a single practically right. you know basically what tom said is just touring off you know a lead you know a hit single and you know we're going to want the deep cut singles the deep cut albums you know that we didn't get to hear before and it's because we we got we have access to it, it used to be you know you put this single out you press it you put it in stores and that's all you could hear until the album right. came out that's not the problem, you know, that's not the situation anymore. So when you give, again, going back to access, when you give people so much access, you expose yourself. Right. You know, you're kind of caught out there where you're kind of like, okay, I've given, you know, so much of me now that I have to deliver because if I don't, then my time is ticking, you know, and, and what, you know, what our attention spans being shorter and shorter and shorter. I don't, I don't have to, I could listen to it and go on to the next thing. Pandora just skipped. Nope, didn't I didn't like it. I'm, I'm keeping it moving, you know. And that's just the the kind of direction we're going right now. And I think, you know, it'll start to show those who um, will prepare for the mile and not the sprint, you know. And um, a deck that you know that kind of wraps everything up with the independent artists. Is in the end, you'll see who, will, you know, last longer and be there in the end. So we want to kind of wind down now. Kyle, are you still around? Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry about that. I had some technical difficulties. You want to go into your uh, your segment? Right. So this is the open mic segment. So pretty much I'm just going to give you guys a statement or a question, and you guys just give me the first thing that comes to mind. So the open mic segment for this one, Noel, I'll start with you, and then Ed and Barry and Tom, you guys can follow up. But the open mic question today is, Name a song that, when it first came out, you didn't like or you didn't think was that great, and years later now, you think it's a great song. Oh, man. Ah, <laughs> uh, let me see. Because hmm. me, generally, when I listen to something and I don't like it, I, I don't like it. <laughs> I really try to <laughs> listen really good, you know, and, and see what it is about it that I don't like. I'll even point that out. But, um, man, that's a tough one to come up with. Let me see. Uh, I'll try to think as well. This is a tough one. Yeah, see, everybody else is thinking right now, right? <laughs> oh, I'm ready. Y'all know me. I'm already go ready. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Let me let me think on that for a second. Well, I've got two, and anybody who follows my work will be surprised because I am a pretty big Timberland fan, but I was not feeling Pony when it first came out. I thought it was too yeah. gimmicky. I thought the production was just overpowering. But after a while, it just settled in with me, and I loved it. And kind of on the more rapish end was a song that has become one of my favorite songs of all time, definitely favorite video of all time, Miss Elliot's The Rain. 
when I first heard mm. that, I'm like, what is going on? It's just like she's just like randomly saying stuff and the beats creaking and cracking and I'm like, what? But once it once it settled in my brain and I digested it, it's one of my favorite songs of all time. Hmm. Okay. Darry, you got one? Um I'm thinking myself. I got two. I got two. Go for it. Um going with, with kind of with um Mar uh Mario Winans, I don't wanna know when it first came out. I, it, I don't know what it was. I think it was the, the sample, you know, maybe because we had, we had heard it, so, I wouldn't say so often, but we've heard it before. You know, it's kind of like, what just can you heard do it differently? Not too long ago. Yeah, so yeah. it was kind of like, what can you do differently? So when it came out, I was like, ah. But then it grew on me. And then the second one was just brand new to not hearing something like that before. It's, uh, Craig David filled me in. When I first yeah. heard it, the tempo change was kind of... It was new. Like, we had never heard, like, a slow R&B song and then, you know, a, a hook come in like that where it just changed the entire, almost, I wouldn't say pop, but, you know, just that upbeat feel and that tempo. It threw me off. And, and the more I listened to it and the more I listened to it, I was like, man, this is this is dope, you know, so. Mine, I just thought of it's um, Music Soul Child's first single, Just Friends. I actually hated the song at first. But it grew on me over the years. I, Neo Soul for me was tough to get into at first, but after a while, it was you know it was, it was just a different side of R and B, and eventually, you know, I, I like it now. Okay. So, well, you got one? Yeah, I'd have to say mine was uh, Jagged Edge, "Let's Get Married," because I didn't mm. like the you know me being a, a lyric a lyric guy, and I listened to the lyrics. Whenever you said you know we might as well do it. <laughs> <laughs> my <laughs> wife hates that bit. song Cause it's like, you know, We that. might as well do it Like, But yeah. I loved it Because them, them, them brothers could sing I like the tones of their voice and I, You know, they, they're just dope But it was it was something about that That lyric that, that threw me a little bit But, you know, I like the overall feel of the record Even though, you know, there was like, what, two or three records That had that, that same feel and sound that they did yeah. But, you know, it, yeah, that I'd have to say Let's Get Married by Jagged Edge Just <laughs> lyric, from the lyric standpoint Man, my wife hates that song. <laughs> See what I'm saying? <laughs> the ladies really, really hate that, but hey, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. Fair enough. The one that I was going to go with is uh, Usher's uh, Here I Stand. And the reason why I didn't mm. like that song initially was because it was too grown for me. I was probably like 17 at the time, and I was used to Usher's radio hits. And here he comes with an Urban AC song. But looking back at it now, that's a great record. Yeah. Clay, you were 17 when they dropped. Look at the low one I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I was paying bills. <laughs> <laughs> also want to give a big shout out to Ralph for penning that song. He's a big supporter of our site. Um, so the last segment we want to get into, guys, you know, we've talked about R&B for what, like an hour now? Um, the one thing that we all have in common, we love R&B. And another thing that we love, we love food. So I want to get into our food discussion. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, of course, with Halloween coming up, um, a lot of great things. We got candy, and of course, we got pumpkin. So I'm gonna lay off this question, and uh, you guys just take it from here. Is pumpkin pie the best type of pie? No, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, pumpkin pie is good, man. It's you know, it's nice texture and all of that kind of stuff. I even say it, it's you know, it's kind of similar to sweet potato pie, but um, nah, it's not the it's not the best. It's not the best, is it? So what is the best? Man, I, I, you know what? It's hard to beat. I mean, I love a sweet potato pie. You know what I'm saying? That's just, it's, it's just dope. But it's hard to beat an apple pie a la mode. Like, you know, in the holiday times, my goodness. Mm. It's tough. It's tough to beat that. Ed? Player, I, pumpkin pie is just whack. Now, sweet potato, <laughs> if you want to get real with it, Sweet potato destroys pumpkin pie. I would compare two artists, but I already am getting enough trouble tonight, so I'm not gonna say <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. But I'm a roll with sweet potato. But my favorite pie, I'm not much of a culinary guy, but I can make. There are a few things I can make, and I make this cheesecake pie, and you throw some cherries on top. It's the, oh, it's bang, it's banging. I might make one tonight just because we're talking about it. But that to me is the best pie. 
Terry? I personally feel like a traitor because I have a pumpkin pie in the oven right now as we speak. Jeez. Uh, but I know when I go home to Richmond that my grandma is going to have one of the best made sweet potato pies I've ever had it in my life that I have over and over and over again. So it's VA. Uh, we know how to make them. I'm telling you. Exactly. VA knows the sweet potato pie. The sweet potato. So I got to go with sweet potato. You know, it's kind of funny you said you feel like a traitor, though. To begin with. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally in the oven. I was like, you know, this is a Trader Joe's. I'm going to pick it up and throw it in the oven. And, <laughs> you know, I can't make it like Grandma. So. <laughs> um, for me, this might come as, as no surprise to you guys. I don't really eat pie, though. I, I'm more, I'm more of like a – give me, like, pudding or something like that with a crusty really? shell. Is that kind of <laughs> How old are you, player, eating pudding? Grown people eat that? I mean, you know, pie, you're talking about fruits, you know, pumpkin, pumpkins. That's just too healthy for me. Give me some fruit. <laughs> See, now you're fronting. You just had the other podcast where you just said that all you eat is, like, grilled chicken. So but that's now not you want to front on the fruit. Though. Yeah, I mean. So you just eat no vegetables. You eat the grilled chicken, no vegetables. I've seen it. It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Kyle, you want to? Man, I was going to, I'm probably an apple pie person, maybe a blueberry pie. I like my blueberry pie. Uh, what I was going to ask you guys is, um, is ice cream necessary on the pie? Mm. Not necessary. It's just that, you know, oh, man, on a, a good apple pie with a nice crisp and crust to it, some a la mode, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's put it like it's like the bonus track on the album. I will take right. I don't think you're gonna target bonus track, but if your album oh already God. has 19 tracks on it, I don't want no bonus track because it's gonna make my stomach hurt because it's too much. So yeah. it depends on the length. That's what we talking about. Um, I have my sweet potato cold straight out of the refrigerator, so no ice cream necessary. No ice cream, but I'll put a little um, whipped cream on on, the, on my pudding. That's about it. Oh, it's pudding. Man, you're pudding, All right, guys, Noel, I appreciate you for coming through and joining us on this podcast. We definitely want to have you back. You know, thank you for taking the time to do this with us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure, man. I appreciate all of your support, and uh, thanks a lot for, for having me on. I appreciate it. I had a good time. Anything thank you want to tell us? Well, yeah, man, get, stay tuned. You know, I've got that new project in in the works. Uh, it's going to be something special, putting a lot of care and, and you know, that passion into it and integrity and um, just trying to to do something special and, and something worthwhile for my listeners and supporters and fans. So um, make sure you check out my radio show, Soul and Be Revival. Uh, it comes on every week. So just check out my pages on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Noel Gordine, N-O-E-L. G O U R D I N on uh, Facebook. It's the real Noel Gordine, and uh, check out my website noelgordine dot com. Cool. So, with that all said, Ed, Barry, thank you for joining us. Tom, always. as usual, <laughs> we're always here. So, I want to thank all the listeners for tuning in, and uh, you know, stay tuned. So, this is Kyle signing out. You know, I got So in Stereo podcast, and we're out. <laughs>